Hello everyone, welcome to the Granite Bay Hilltop Church Sabbath School. Whether you're here in the sanctuary with us this morning or whether you're watching at home online in the local area across the country or around the world, thank you for joining us for lesson number two of our quarterly on the great controversy. But before we get into that this morning, I want to point you to our free offering that we have to go along with this lesson. It's this pocket book called The Flesh and the Spirit. And you can get that by dialing 866-788-3966 and asking for offer number 792. If you're in the United States, you can also text the code SH079 to the number 40544. And if you're outside of the United States, you can go on your computer and go to your URL and type in study.aftv.org forward slash SH079 and you can get that free download. Well, before we begin our study this today, let's begin with a word of prayer. Loving Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to open up your word and study and learn and grow. And Lord, our prayer is that the Holy Spirit would guide us, give us wisdom and understanding. But most of all, Lord, show us what you would have us do in these last days. And we pray and ask for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I'm sure that we are all aware that today we find ourselves in the middle of a battle, in the middle of a great controversy. It's not something that we asked for. It's not something that we initiated. We were born into it. It was thrust upon us, if you will. Because our first parents disobeyed God, we are born with the propensity to sin. We live in a sinful world, and there is an enemy of God who is trying to destroy us. We're caught in the middle of this controversy between Christ and Satan, between good and evil. And on one side, you have Satan and his angels, and they have taken this world captive and we are in their grasp. And even though Satan has already lost the battle, he has not relinquished control yet. On the other side, you have Jesus Christ who has already won the victory. He has already provided a way of escape. But Jesus is never going to take away your free will. He will not force you to follow his plan. You are a free moral agent and you can choose heaven or hell. You can choose life or death. Well, that sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? Well, if I can choose heaven or hell, I choose heaven. If I can choose love or selfishness, I choose love. That sounds pretty easy. But family, I wish it were that easy. Yes, it's simple, but it's not easy. Today we are looking at lesson number two, the central issue, love or selfishness. Again, that sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? I choose love over selfishness. I choose God's way. God is love and Satan's way is the way of selfishness. The Bible is full of types and shadows, types and anti-types. The type is earthly and physical. The anti-type is heavenly and spiritual. And the Bible is full of many different types. Jo uh, Joseph was a type of Christ. The king of Tyre is a type of Lucifer who became Satan. The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD was a type pointing to the anti-type, which is uh, Satan trying to destroy God's people, spiritual Israel, at the end of time. And Satan is working hard and he has a, a two-pronged attack. He's trying to deceive 
and he's trying to destroy. And what he can't accomplish through persecution, he is attempting to accomplish through compromise. And friends, that's a big problem in the church today. If Satan can't beat us from without, he will try and defeat us from within. On the other hand, Jesus does not persecute. Jesus does not destroy. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. In John chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus said, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. I love how it tells us in Sunday's lesson that Jesus' love for his people flows from a heart of infinite love. He repeatedly appealed to them in love to repent and to accept his gracious invitation of mercy. You can go through all four of the Gospels and you can see how Jesus repeatedly was trying to show the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the religious leaders of that day that he was there for their benefit. He was there to seek and to save that which is lost. But many of them rejected him. And we see that because of that, Jesus was a broken hearted savior. It tells us in Luke chapter 19, verse 41 to 44, that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He said, because you did not know the time of your visitation, because you didn't seek the truth which would bring you peace, the truth will be hidden from you. And friends, that's the reality in Israel today. They are still blinded from the truth. <clears throat> I want you to notice in Matthew 23, verse 37 to 38, Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. He closes by saying, see, your house is left to you desolate. Jesus' desire is for us to be gathered to him, to surrender to him, choose love not selfishness. Notice Isaiah 53 verse 3 says that Jesus is a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief because he came to his own people and his own people received him not. In these verses we can see that Jesus is not willing that any should perish. He has provided the way for us to be saved. He has paid our penalty for us. He has given us the victory over the devil and his schemes and deceptions, but he gives us the choice. Are we going to choose love or are we going to choose selfishness? You know, sometimes it's hard for us to understand how a God of love could allow rape and murder, incest, uh, the death of, a, of an innocent child, destruction. Well, we see in Scripture that God does not always intervene to limit the results of choice. Sometimes God allows the natural consequences of rebellion to develop. In fact, that's what we've been seeing over the last 6,000 years. Initially, when, when Lucifer sinned in heaven and drew a third of the angels away, the, the, uh, the remaining two-thirds of the angels, they didn't understand the deceitfulness, the, the wickedness of sin. And so God has had to allow that all to develop. And we come to the, the day in which we live where we see that open rebellion is uh, right in your face. And, and we see that, that uh, this is all being played out. But we also see that sometimes... God does choose to intervene 
and to uh, prevent certain things. In fact, on uh, Monday's lesson, we saw that God did intervene and he warned the Christians in 70 AD that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And in fact, the, that they were able to get out and uh, save their lives. There are many scriptures where God did intervene and uh, he often tells his people, like in Isaiah 41 verse 10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right arm. Here we see that God doesn't promise to take away all of the challenges and difficulties and heartache and pain of life. He often allows that, uh, those consequences of, of choice to play out. And sometimes we see that uh, things happen uh, and just seems like a, a circumstance. Uh, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said that time and circumstance happens to us all. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes we're in the wrong place at the wrong time and it may be somebody else's choice uh, somebody may have chose to drink and drive and someone was killed as a result and God allows those things to happen. Sometimes uh, things happen because of our own bad choices and then sometimes God chooses to intervene but God is always there. He doesn't promise to take it away but he promises to be with you. I will be with you. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you, he says. Notice Romans 8, 38 and 39. The Apostle Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angel nor principality nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor heights nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Paul has confidence. He says there's nothing all of the difficulties and challenges and heartache of life, there's nothing that can separate us from God except if we choose the way of selfishness rather than the way of love. Notice Romans 8.31, Paul says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? God is sovereign. God rules over the events of the earth and sometimes he chooses to intervene if it accomplishes his divine purpose. I really like those three worthy Hebrew boys in Daniel chapter 3 who were ready, uh, uh, going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And I love what they said. They said, our God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to the image that you have set up. And so they understood God is able to intervene if he chooses. But if he doesn't, we're still going to love him. We're still going to follow him. We're going to choose the way of love. You know, you know, even in the most challenging times, even in the most vicious attacks of Satan, God is able to sustain his people. But we also understand that God is trying to bring this controversy to an end. Imagine if every time we prayed, God answered that prayer in a positive way. Imagine if every time there was some difficulty, we could just pray it away. This controversy would continue on forever. But God is wanting to bring it to a close. And sometimes he allows his people to suffer at the hand of the enemy. I love what it says in the Great Controversy, page 41. It says, in vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the church of Christ by violence. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when these faithful standard bearers fell at their post. By defeat, they conquered. God's workmen were slain. 
but his work went steadily forward. Notice here that it says that God allowed his faithful people to fall, but it served a greater purpose. It reveals that the more that Satan attacked the first century church, the more the church grew. In the book of Acts, you can see uh, the persecution that was happening, but you can see the results of it. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, uh, as a result of that persecution, 3,000 were added to the church. In Acts chapter 4, verse 4, because of the persecution, now they are 5,000 strong. The disciples faced threats, they faced imprisonment, they faced persecution and death, and yet in the power of the Holy Spirit, with great boldness, the gospel went to the world in a very short period of time. I love the opening statement in Wednesday's lesson. It says the early church grew not only because its members preached the gospel, but because they lived the gospel. This seems to indicate that true Christianity is more than intellectual knowledge of Jesus. It's about having the heart of Jesus. It's about doing what he did. It's about following his example. And it was their unselfish love and commitment to meeting human needs that contributed along with the sharing of the good news, the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit that made such an impact on the world. I'd like you to open up your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2. I want to look at this first century church. Acts chapter 2. And I want you to notice what it says, starting in verse 44, talking about uh, the, the early church. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Here we see this early church. They were committed to each other. They were a community. They uh, loved each other. They spent a tremendous amount of time together and they helped each other. And of course, they broke bread together. You know, there's just something about sharing a meal together that draws us uh, together as the family of God. I want you to notice the formula that Jesus gave to the disciples and to the early church in how to win souls. It tells us in the book, Ministry of Healing, page 143, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. And you know, God is calling us to the same thing today. It's friendship evangelism, that we would uh, help those around us sympathize with them, minister to their needs, and then say, hey, come be a part of our group. I want you to notice, too, in the Great Controversy, page 18, it says, in the great controversy raging in the universe, the devil wants to deface the image of God in humanity. The purpose of the gospel is to restore the image of God in humanity. This restoration includes physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual healing. Here we see it's a, a holistic approach that God desires us to be whole in all aspects of life, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Notice John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And so friends, 
Choose love, not selfishness. It's simple, but it's not easy. You see, family, our world is facing an enormous crisis today. Jesus tells us in Matthew 24 what the signs are going to be right before his coming, and we are seeing them unfolding right before our eyes today. We're in the middle of this controversy that has overtaken us. The time of Jacob's trouble is coming, and Jesus sends us into this world, this broken world, as ambassadors for him. We are to touch others with his love. We are to help them to choose love and not selfishness. And as you go back to that first century church, you discover that they were a community. They were united. And the more that the, the, the darker and darker that the world got, the closer and closer they were together. And that's what we need today, if we would but choose love. I want you to notice John chapter 13, verse 35. Jesus says, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. In Thursday's lesson, Pastor Mark Finley talked about the great revelations of God's love and how it was demonstrated in two pandemics uh, that happened in 160 AD and 260 AD. And he says that in these plagues that killed thousands of people, it was the unselfish, sacrificial, caring, loving ministry of Christians that made the biggest impact on society. They became a virtual army of God going about doing good. And what is the obvious message that is portrayed there? That when we die to self and we manifest a selfless spirit, God will work through his people in a very powerful way. It's not easy, but it's simple. Choose love or choose selfishness. And God loves us. And Jesus gave himself for us. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And even though it may appear that the enemy is winning, God is still in control. And you know, God hurts when we hurt. He is brokenhearted when people hate him. He, he's brokenhearted when we refuse his help. He's brokenhearted when we reject the only way by which we must be saved. In his providence, he is moving this controversy to an end. And when his faithful are persecuted, he reminds us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, do not fear those who can kill the body but not kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. He tells us not to allow anyone to take away our faith, but remain connected to him, loyal to him, and then he will take care of the rest. That we should be a caring community with a legacy of love even as we approach earth's darkest moments. I want you to notice what it says in the great controversy, page 47. God has given us sufficient evidence of his love and we are not to doubt his goodness because we cannot understand the workings of his providence. Sometimes it's under, hard to understand how God can allow a loved one to go through cancer 
or some other difficulty. But we are not to doubt God's love for us. God is still with us. And so that brings us to the end of our time together today. We've been talking about the central issue, love or selfishness. And God leaves it to you which one you will choose. It's simple, but it's not always easy. We have to reject that selfishness that we are inherently born with, and we have to choose love and surrender our hearts to God. I want to remind you of our free offering, The Flesh and the Spirit, this pocketbook that you can get. The numbers are on your screen for uh, getting that. And let's close with a word of prayer. Loving Father, you are so merciful. You are so good. And Lord, you've given us free will. You've given us the opportunity to choose you, to choose life, to choose love, or to choose to follow the enemy, to choose selfishness, to choose death. Well, Lord, it should be a very simple, easy choice for us, but it's not always easy. But Lord, you have provided the way. So we pray for the strength and the courage and the ability to choose you and to choose life. And we ask for it all in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and have a great day. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, may God be with you, guiding and directing you all along your journey. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want. And most important, to share it with others.